Welcome, I'm Dr. Robert Groves, your host for the Groves Connection podcast. The Groves Connection brings you intimate conversations with pundits, providers, patients, leaders, and lay people, all to help us understand a contradiction. How can our healthcare system be both magnificent and yet so deeply flawed? We're going inside healthcare to talk candidly with those who know. What they have to say may delight, surprise, frustrate, or at times even anger you. But I invite you to get curious and listen to the truth about healthcare and those who want to fix it. Maybe the answers have been there all along. We just need to make the connection. Are you ready to connect? Dr. Brent James, welcome back to the Groves Connection. A delight to be with you today, Robert, <laughs> as always. The reason I wanted to have another conversation, uh, first of all, because I enjoy our conversations immensely, but second of all, because I've been educating myself on metrics, uh, specifically as they apply uh, to healthcare, and I know that's an area of expertise uh, for you, and so I thought I'd... I'd uh, explore a little bit with you how you think about metrics and and how you think uh, uh, they ought to be used and how they might be misused. In context, I think that it was Jerry Muller, who's at Catholic University in D.C., uh, had a book out a couple of years ago called The Tyranny of Metrics. Yeah. I recently read that, and it, it really changed my view of value-based care incentives. I think it's worth talking about that because I, I don't think a lot of people are today. Well, well, first of all, Robert, we have to say that value-based care is a good idea in and of itself outside of the metrics. Yes. A very strong idea. Of course, metrics play a key role, don't they, in terms of how we oversee it, we coordinate it. I came to Utah on the Intermountain Healthcare, 1986, and I had a few things sitting here that actually made it possible. One was the first continuously operating electronic medical record system in the world, developed by Homer Warner uh, at LDS Hospital, a very, very capable team of people, the father really of medical informatics, gave us a substrate for measurement. And it's one that we could manipulate easily. Um, we had very direct control over the content of that thing. The other was surprising, uh, a fellow named Steve Busbu, who was uh, vice president for finance in 1983, he built one of the world's first and only activity-based costing systems. He had deployed it across all Intermountain facilities. Uh, means I had very granular, extremely accurate measurements of costs. Now, those cost data, they were tracking every single little thing you did for a patient. Yeah. A single dose of a drug by route, a single lab test, a single imaging exam, a six-minute block of physician time by specialty, an hour block of nursing time, a minute in a procedure room, that level of detail, anything from central supply. Um, and, uh, Brent, can you contrast that with how most systems do that work? Yeah. So a full cost master would have twenty-five to 30,000 items in it, you know, at a fairly granular level. Most people run their financial systems not bottom up like this. They run them top down. They start with departmental budgets. Uh, and then they build them around, oh, there are about 15,000, 16,000 federal billing codes for fee-for-service billing. Uh, now, billing codes do have some correspondence to a true cost master, but you can obviously see 30,000 yeah. items versus 15. We call it bundling, where you take a handful of things and combine them together. And frankly, our cost master had details that the federal billing system just didn't touch. And it's night and day when you use them. So we call that top-down federal system cost to charge ratios. So they start with a departmental budget. They can measure that pretty accurately. Then they use the billing codes and a set of nationally published tables and try to back them in to say, what did that CBC, that complete blood count cost me? Instead gotcha. of building it up from the bottom like you do with the cost master, much, much higher levels of accuracy. Right. Well, I had those two things. I had a third though. I came out of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and uh, well, I had a a professorship at Harvard School of Public Health, 
my main role was uh, randomized controlled trials. We were doing randomized controlled trials of new cancer therapies out of the Farber. Uh, I was over GI cancers for the largest multi-center trials group in the world. We had about 450 contributing medical centers. Well, when as I showed up there as a young researcher, they had a standard for how you created the data systems. Okay. It was based upon rigorous investigation. It had a few spectacular failures early on in trials. I mean, where they spent lots of money on a big trial, millions and millions of dollars, and it failed to produce a scientific result. Not positive or negative, no result at all. Okay, and it was sure. failure of the data systems. Well, I got heavily trained, let's just say. There was a standard, we followed up. And that standard turned out to be wonderfully useful when building data systems at Intermountain for clinical conditions. Wonderfully useful. Talk to me a little bit about uh, when you say wonderfully useful, what was it that set it apart from uh, yeah. the, the pack? Well, so there are a couple of other ideas let's toss out there and then get into the specifics just a bit. Um, okay. The first is, is what is the target of measurement? If I were saying an Ed Deming style from a quality perspective, I'd say aim defines the system. What is the aim of your measurement system? Okay. But realize that measurement, it's our eyes, it's our ability to see. Humans can sense a certain amount of information from the external environment through the normal senses. Hearing, eyesight, taste, touch, feel, we have many more than that, of course. For the vast majority of what we do in clinical care, though, it's invisible to the naked human eye. Or even if we have a sense of it, it doesn't give us enough granular detail. So when you're building measures, you're always thinking of what's the purpose? What am I trying to make visible here? So three tiers. It's really funny, Robert. I just spent two weeks in Sweden. Uh, they're building yeah. a national learning system. And this was a core part of our conversation. They have about 125 national registries, disease-specific registries. And the question is, is what do you put into the registry? Well, yeah, he, sure. what's the aim? So the three tiers, our primary purpose was to support a clinician interacting with the patient. Some people call that clinical decision support. It's taking gotcha. data and turning it into true, useful clinical information. So it needs to show up on its own, pop up, the exact thing you need right when you need it, doctor. Gotcha. As you're interacting. So tier one, you're designing for transparency at the front line as a clinician interacts with the patient. Tier two, on above that, you're talking about process level. So now you're thinking about not just one diabetic that you're seeing that day, you're thinking about all your diabetics in your practice and how are you managing them and how are they doing as a group. Okay. So it's a process focus. That's where improvement science lives. The third is the external view, looking in from outside. Um, that's a a patient or a customer saying who's best, I guess, an insurer trying to make sure they're getting value for their money. In the extreme, it's uh, regulators and overseers, right? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the trick. Most people design data systems top down, starting with that external view. Yes. Um, we design them bottom up. It turns out it's a one-way street. If you design top down, if I design that third tier, they're not very useful for process metrics and almost never are they very useful or for frontline interactions. Yes. See? On the other hand, if I design bottom up, if I design around that clinical interaction, number one, I can capture the data during the interaction in a very uh, yeah. complete, accurate and timely form. And it gives me probably the most robust process level data you could ever want and the most robust external view comparative outcomes data you could ever want. But it's, it's one way. If you design top down, you can't get down. Gotcha. To yeah, yeah. On that. But if you design bottom up, you, you get all three. I thought of the care protocols we were using for clinical decision support to manage care inside Intermountain. We had some real successes, as you know. Yes. I thought of them as the control arm of randomized controlled trials. Gotcha. And that okay. data sets that way. Now, now, here's a funny thing that happens. If you do that, the data you capture turns out to be the stuff that the clinical team must have to do their work. Okay. It has a couple of advantages. It means if I'm careful and clever, I can build it into the clinical workflow so I catch it on the fly and it doesn't feel like a burden. So, so, and, and you and I have had this conversation before, but it kind of reminds me of the economic theories of Friedrich Hayek. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that, you know, bottom up is the way, uh, and that basically is the market in economic theory. It's you pay attention to the market. You don't try to centrally control 
because you can't uh, you can't know from the top down the detail that's at that bottom level where the rubber meets the road, for example. And you're no. saying uh, not exactly analogous, but you're saying a similar thing in no. uh, metrics in healthcare that uh, the knowledge has to come from uh, that place where the rubber meets the road, where the the clinician is interacting with the patient. And no. furthermore, you're saying that. Uh, you know, a top-down metric may or may not be easy to capture. It may or may not be meaningful to the clinician. Usually, it it's not in a, in the form that it's delivered. Uh, and furthermore, you're interrupting the workflow to check a box or to collect yeah. something that you wouldn't otherwise do. Is that? Am I with you so far? That's, you're basically correct. You okay. know, Don Berwick and I and Molly Coy wrote a paper about this in medical care some years ago, and we talked about two viewpoints. One is selection. Mm -hmm. where you're saying who's best, which hospital's best, which physician's best. Um, it's that external view. The other we call change. It's really improvement, but it's that yes. bottom-up view. And nice little paper just pointing out that those are kind of in contrast or in conflict with one another. They're not really, if you design bottom-up, then they fit right. together. But going the other way just doesn't work. We also Twice at Institute of Medicine, back when we were still IOM, now we're National Academy of Medicine. Twice we studied this. I don't know that we ever published it, but came to two different definitions of the word transparency. And one's okay. it's bottom up, where you're really you're looking for transparency at the front line, clinical decision support for that clinical team as they deliver care. But Robert, that's where all the action happens. That's where all the change yes. happens. And yes. that's the part that makes a real difference versus that external looking outside in view right? Gotcha. Accountability. Yes, yes. And you can go way over the top on those external metrics. And what they do is they destroy any hope you ever had of building transparency at the front line. Yeah. They consume yeah. all the resources. They take all the attention. And, and, and they ignore key aspects of yeah. the relationship at yeah. the ground level. That's right. The stuff that matters. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So what is it that you want to make transparent? What is it you want to see? But you have to be thoughtful about designing that whole system. So this is a conversation we were having in Sweden with their national registries. Data are essential. They're critical. That ability yes. to see it. If you can't see it, you're not going to be able to manage it. Correct. So how do we get the right data in the right hands at the right time? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you I, know... Mueller uh, makes the case that uh, the, the fundamental issue with, uh, particularly with top-down metrics, is uh, well, you know, there, there are two problems. One is it's top-down, and so the knowledge is lost, and you're guessing and usually wrong about <laughs> what's useful. And the second is those metrics, those top-down metrics, are often tied to reward and punishment. Yeah, and he makes the point that once you do that you start to distort the metrics. They're going to be gained to some extent. Even yeah. if at the margin, you're just talking about a little tweak, you start to have an incentive for sure, but an incentive to tweak the metric yeah. uh, to meet your needs. And uh, there's a distortion there that happens that's, well, I mean, my mind goes to the function that we have every year at the end of the year on the payer side, which is to go into patient charts. We hire somebody, spend lots of money to go into patient charts, and see how sick we can make them, how many right. diagnoses we can give them, because it's called risk adjustment. But is it really once it's distorted by that manipulation? Yeah. Uh, it, it might be within parameters so that it passes you know, this, uh, the test of is it outright fraud, but it's still bending towards sicker. Well, well, you're hinting at some federal criminal fraud investigations that are underway right now. You do know yes. that rather yes. obviously around exactly that problem, diagnoses that are thrown into a patient's problem list, but we're not managing them. They're, yes. they're not significant enough that we need to deliver any clinical care whatsoever, but it is a way of manipulating the data. It's most visible in Medicare Advantage. It increases your monthly Medicare Advantage pay payments for a patient, but, but also used in so many other areas of medicine. You know, every major quality guru talked about this. Deming first, perhaps the most eloquent, the father of quality improvement theory, he said, when confronted with a metric that you have to achieve, so incentives to hit a number, he said you have three choices. Number one, I could actually improve the process. Hard work takes a while, right? Number two, I can teach to the test. Yes. Uh, so that metric is focusing a spotlight on one little element of my work. 
Um, and so I get under the spotlight and I really buff it up, make it pretty. Um, the trouble is, I mean, demonstrated, I actually have some empiric data showing this happening in healthcare, by the way, a little bit. It's hard to find. Yeah. Uh, think of the things that aren't under the spotlight. Yes. Uh, and Deming demonstrated that overall quality for the whole enterprise goes down wow. so that you can buff the quality under the spotlight to do well on the metric. Yes. So, yeah. And this, this is the same complaint that occurs in education around No Child Left Behind. Uh, is but it's, it's not just education. It's the test. The, the, yeah. the universities are even worse than we are. I mean, the, the, the gaming that goes on in university, they, they have these systems that rank universities for high school students choosing a university, and it's yes. become a, a big business. And uh, there are a couple of really good books on that. And let's just say the argument's compelling and yeah. a little bit stunning and a little bit deeply discouraging. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's accelerated, hasn't it? I mean, there are more yeah. and more top-down metrics. I, Don Berwick, he wrote about this problem in 1995, if I remember yeah. correctly. And Deming it's gotten so it. much worse. Yeah. Deming wrote about it in the 50s. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. And so yeah. it's common in any setting. Of course, after teach to the test, the next is just game the data. And you can do it in a way that you can convince yourself you're not being fraudulent. Yeah. So a real story. Uh, I was one of the three founders of something called High Value Healthcare Collaborative, 15 big health systems, uh, probably at least 20, 30% of all hospitals in the country. Had a shared database. Everybody submitted what's basic claims data. All right. So we had that basis of records. Uh, well, CMS came out with their hospital compare metrics. Um, one of them, just to illustrate, went along the list was uh, mortality for patients with heart failure. Yes. And they ranked the country. So we were looking at the heart failure mortality data from CMS. Uh, at the time, Intermountain as a system was 34th percentile. We were just barely above the bottom third of the country in mortality. Yeah. The best group that we had in HVHC was the University of California, San Diego. They were at 94th percentile. Well, here's what we did. Turns out it's the federal government. Uh, so we requested their risk adjustment program. It's a sure. program written in a stats package called SAS. Yeah, because sure. it's the federal government, you can call them up and say, please send me the code. And they yes. did. Took a couple of my statisticians a month to get it to run on our instantation of SAS. There's a certain amount of work you have to do, but then we completely replicated the federal report perfectly. So we we're pretty sure it was running true. Then looking at heart failure mortality, uh, we looked at their risk adjustment model. It's what's called a linear model. So you get beta weights and you can tell what are the most important factors. Uh, now, technically, by the way, the way that CMS runs that, it's not really a risk adjustment system. It's a ranking adjustment system. But that's a technical definition for the deeply cynical among us. It feeds a lot of our conspiracy theories, but there you go. Well, it turned out by far the most important thing was something called protein calorie malnutrition. Hmm. You needed a diagnosis code in the list of diagnostic codes for the patient protein calorie malnutrition. That completely explained differences in documenting that, uh, completely explained their high performance versus Intermountain's low performance. So they got a higher risk score based on protein calorie malnutrition? Is that Yeah. So it's common with, you know, the most common way to measure it is just a low blood albumin. Um, ah, everybody in the hospital has a low albumin, though. Yeah, I mean, you, got yeah. yeah. you got it. Yeah. So what we did was just go back and uh, I modeled it. I didn't actually do it. I have trouble doing stuff like this. But I just took anybody who had, a, I had all the, the you know, it's just part of a basic metabolic panel. I had albumin levels sure. for every patient, had it for all our heart failure patients, just went back and pulled their lab data. Um, and the vast majority of them had low blood albumins and it would have been adequate to diagnose. I could have generated and inserted, like we went up into the uh, mid 90s, 95th percentile. Wow, that is astonishing. And that, what UCSD had is they had an interested physician just by happenstance who got interested in malnutrition in hospitalized patients. Gotcha. He was really into it. He was an early adopter. He started a specialty clinic. And because of his clinic and his work, it was just, I mean. He was paying was attention to it. And the diagnosis was being identified yeah. and used for the risk adjustment. And there was uh, the the... Oh. 34th percentile to 90 plus percentile yeah, difference. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So another fun thing as a statistician that I do is uh, in ranking systems, you can calculate confidence intervals around ranks. And now it's a special brand of statistics. You need to be a little careful about how you talk about it. It's really easy to get misaligned and distracted. 
Turns out that very often the confidence interval will span, oh, half, two thirds of the full ranking range. And this classic wow. study in Sweden, looking at, a, I, I want to say it was 87 hospitals, looking at the risk adjusted AMI rates, mortality rates. Um, you could either be number one or you could be number 37 out of 80, 87. So if those confidence intervals, when you have a measure, let's yeah. say the measure is 10, yeah. but the confidence intervals will tell you what range that could actually be if you measured it again tomorrow or yeah. the next day. You know, it's random yeah. to some extent. It just takes out the random noise, just random noise alone. Mm -hmm. How much would it fluctuate? Yes, random noise. It could be from, and what you're saying is half of the range. Yeah. And so your confidence that you're number one versus number 37 is, I mean, there's there's essentially no difference between those two, essentially is what- Not statistically, not, not at a 5% yeah. p-value. Gotcha, okay. All right, uh, yeah. and I don't want to dig off into the statistics of it. It's fun, it's fascinating, but only for a certain type of geek. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing you need to know is, is that those ranks have very wide confidence intervals and your rank could be quite different based upon that. So it turns out ranking systems aren't very accurate. They don't change market share either. Hmm. Only 2 to 3% of patients pay attention to those kinds of rankings when choosing a hospital or a physician. They rely yeah. instead on a trusted advisor, usually in the form of a referring physician. I mean, the, a counselor who's there, somebody they trust, or word of mouth from their friends. Uh, unless it's a, a really new bleeding edge technology, which is not widely available. Then yeah. it has, but for most things, there's a, a set of geeks in society, two or 3% who will pay attention, but not much. We end up investing all of our money as mandates Yes. Coming down the chain. Yeah, that is frustrating because there's not nearly as much invested in true quality improvement as yeah. there is in these external metrics and and for obvious reasons. That's where the money is. If you yeah. if you don't hit those external metrics which are not nearly as useful where the rubber meets the road on the front line where yeah. you're actually taking care of patients, they interfere with the workflow, they distract from other aspects of care. And in cases like the, the ones you're uh, talking about, the confidence intervals are so broad that unless there are, you know, the top and bottom, essentially, uh, they're, they're yeah. really, you can't claim that there's a difference. Yeah, when they claim statistical significance for these models, for these ranking models, technically what that actually shows is, is that at least one member of the sample, at least one hospital, is different uh, from the of the group. And that's what wow. statistical significant means, at least one. Now, when we start to compare across hospitals, they're called contrasts. Let's just say it's a whole different ballgame. Um, yeah. So is the model statistically significant? Yeah. And that's a big, so what? Who cares? I, I can tell the extremes. Right. But that's not very useful. No, no. All of this is, is stuff that Mueller pointed out in his book. It's stuff that uh, Berwick pointed out in his article. It, and, and apparently Deming was writing about uh, 45 uh, yeah. years before that. A lot of value-based care now is based on the premise that we're going to use a fee-for-service model, but at the end of the period, whatever that period is, usually a quarter or a year, uh, we're going to look at these externally derived top-down metrics. And depending on what they show, you're going to get a bonus. So here's reward and punishment tied to top-down metrics. So what's, what is the impact of that on the delivery of care? I built data systems for clinical decision support as their primary aim, and they worked, by the way. Yeah. They use convincing data that, yeah, the care really did change. Uh, by that point, we understood Deming's second premise, the idea that quality controls costs. I had Busboom's activity-based costing system, so I could measure costs very accurately. And we were seeing exactly what Deming predicted as our quality went up. In most instances, our cost of operations mm -hmm. fell. I published a little article in Harvard Business Review of All Crazy Places in 2016. It links directly to the payment system. Uh, the question is, is when you eliminate waste, when you reduce your costs, yeah. you get some money. Now, it's always the care provider group who has to invest in the change. And it always right. costs. If you paid fee for service, 85% uh, of the time, all of the savings you produce are going to go back to the purchasers as windfall savings. And yeah. you're going to be left holding the bag, not just for the cost of running the change initiative, uh, but also it'll probably damage your financials looking forward. If you're paid 
per case payments, you'll pick up about maybe 55% of the potential, depending okay. upon the specific case. But if you want all of it, you need to be capitated. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. So yeah. these various shared savings models that are people were building on top of, of a top down cost to charge ratio uh, fee for service billing system, you're pointing out the obvious problems. On the other hand, I've seen some truly powerful partnerships between insurers and care providers where you build bottom up in a convincing way and you, you just treat it differently. So you get something yeah. both sides believe is real. Uh, and yeah. then you share the savings on that basis is the basic idea. But to right. do it, I need to build around the clinical decision support layer, right? And move up to a process layer. Quality improvement tolerates really dirty data. Hmm. Uh, but the truth is, is if you build it this way, quality data are complete. So if you're looking for something, it's always there. They're accurate. They reflect reality and they're timely. We got ours running basically real time. I mean, the yeah. results are back within minutes and you can design for that. People use those data for care. So if there are an error, they tended to correct it down at the front line. Yeah, You could tell what was happening in the process. We were tracking financials. As a matter of principles, we always track financial data side by side with the clinical data at a detail level. And with that combination, you could figure out exactly what was happening financially and exactly what was happening clinically. Uh, the boundaries came in, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Estimate around it. So you could build a shared savings model. Uh, I don't know if it works as well top down, quick and dirty on the fly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, when I when I think about this, because I I remember the first time I heard about uh, continuous quality improvement, or you know, there are lots of monikers for it, but the Deming method, it was intuitively obvious to me that that made sense. Now, the, the knock on it is a lot of uh, folks say, well, that's really hard to do, and there are pieces of it in a lot of systems. We do see this method being used in a lot of systems, but why hasn't that caught on more? And why do we still see uh, inexorable rises in healthcare costs? I mean, I have my own uh, thoughts about that, but I'd love yours. What, what What is it that is holding us back there? <laughs> I am convinced by the data that the Healthcare Cost Institute is producing that most of what we're seeing for healthcare cost increases are price fixing, classic monopolistic price fixing. Yeah. Use something called the Hirschman Herfindel Index to measure market concentration. Uh, over 80% of the population of the United States lives in communities uh, where it's either a, a strict monopoly or a small oligopoly relative to hospital services, at least. And HCCI makes a pretty compelling case that that's the source of just increase your prices. Yeah. Get yeah. big so you can play monopoly, basically. Um, and that very clearly is going on at a policy level. Um so check out their data if you're interested. Gotcha. The second, I spent a lifetime trying to convince my administrative and clinical colleagues. The math is is overwhelming. The math is absolutely convincing. I, it was one of my regional vice presidents, actually, who said it to me best. He said, Brent, I get it. He says, the math is compelling. The financial opportunities by eliminating quality-associated waste, where you improve your quality to get lower costs. He said, it's just, yeah, it's a convincing argument. He says, the data are clear. He said... But, you know, I've lived my entire life managing the fee-for-service budgets. He said, in the fee-for-service world, I know where the levers are. Yeah. He said, I'm really held accountable to those budgets. I know where the levers are. He said, boy, you get out in this new world you're talking about. And he said, it just it makes me just feel so at risk, so uncertain. Uh, and I think there's a large element of that. You can still get by doing it the old way. I think that's why change so often happens from the outside, not from the inside. Ah, uh, yes. That kind yes, of the disruptors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do have some disruptors in the marketplace in the United States right now. Yes, we, we do. do. And I, I think that, um, you know, I track that fairly closely and it continues to grow. And as it continues to grow, we'll be forced to adapt and forced to change our systems yeah, along the yeah. way. But it's been a long, hard slog, hasn't it? Toward yes. That. Yes, and frustrating for those of us who aren't married to the fee-for-service system and would like to see uh, real change. Um, you know, the other thing it reminds me of, and this is a premise I haven't I've said out loud to only a few, but I really believe that the way that we're using metrics, the top-down reward and punishment, uh, first of all, I think it's just a, 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 a technologically enabled Taylorism to some extent. Sure is. And, and and second, I think it is a major contributor to burnout, not just in healthcare, but across 
every industry that's gone down that road, whether it's government, education, uh, law enforcement, I think it's a contributor and, and maybe a primary contributor to burnout. It's dehumanizing. Yeah. It, it stifles internal motivation. I, I don't understand why we are not able to, to see that clearly. Now, having said that, you know, it's only been recently that I had the aha moment and realized what the damaging aspects of a fee for service married to bonus tied to reward and punishment the damage that could do. And so maybe it's not so astounding because I've been part of the problem for a significant amount of the time. But it is so clear to me now, <laughs> you know, that, well, yeah. that that's a major contributor. Let me try a little thought experiment with you. Okay. I do this to people. I've been doing it for the last 15 years, I've done it to a lot of groups inside and outside of healthcare, okay. especially inside though, including clinical groups. Okay. So uh, early on, we took on the problem of type 2 diabetes mellitus. We had about 65,000 type 2 diabetes mellitus patients. We build a, oh, most people call it evidence-based best practice guidelines. We call them a care process model that you embed into the clinical workflow as described. We use that to build a data set. We were the applied research center that built the HEDIS measures for diabetes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I can say that those at least were built right. Uh, <laughs> well, they're meaningful, but, that's for sure. Yeah. What I show is this dramatic change in performance. Uh, my best data come out of a, a randomized controlled trial we ran uh, of um, complex diabetics. So type 2 diabetes mellitus, at least three significant comorbid diseases. We showed a 7% improvement in survival rates at two years. Wow. Uh, yeah, from 82 to 89%. Uh, we showed uh, about a 25% relative of two-year hospitalization rate for these sick patients fell from 39% to 31%. Physician productivity went up 8%. We were measuring that. Made the practice a little bit faster and easier. It, it saved tens of millions of dollars in yes. cost. Then I show people the tools that I used to do it. We had four tools that we deployed. Okay. The first is an action list. It's based off a registry idea, and it basically lists every diabetic patient in your practice. Okay. And people would tend to go through it once a month. We'd insist on it every quarter, but once a month, they'd go through. And it listed every metric blood pressures, blood sugars, lipids, you know, and it say, is the testing timely? And is it under control or the levels at the right rate? And any patient that was not at ideal care got flagged. Got and what would typically happen is a nurse would go through it. And if they had patients who hadn't been in for a visit, maybe, you know, it made the care continuous, not episodic because you'd call them up and bring them in. Right. Send them to the diabetic educator or whatever. Well, that was number one action list. Number two, we called it a patient worksheet. It, it was generated. So anytime you show up in the exam room with the patient, it was either on the computer, if you're electronic or on a piece of paper, it listed their demographics, it listed their current problem list. That's where we figured out they had diabetes from the problem list. Right. It listed a, a, oh, a basically immunization screening summary, a full med list, labs pertinent to their chronic conditions, exams pertinent to the chronic conditions. The bottom, we call them a, a passive reminders are really orders. We named them passive reminders to avoid legal perjuration. And everybody <laughs> uses them as orders. You just check them off. Very popular. My internist, I'm not diabetic, but he would generate one of these as a, as a visit record. <laughs> yeah. Send me yeah, home. No, I anyway, yeah. Number three was comparative outcomes, where we showed each physician how their practice compared to their region and to the system as a whole for each of the metrics and the testing rates. A version of that went to your medical director. Gotcha. All right. And finally, we had a financial incentive. This okay. was a major contributor to about a plus or minus $3,000 swing each year. Okay. Well, I say, okay, here are the four tools we deployed. Action lists, patient worksheets, comparative outcomes, shows how you compare to your peers, and financial incentives. I show you the change that resulted that were directly causally attributable to that package. Then I okay. ask people, which one of those four had the biggest impact on changing performance? Was it the action lists? Was it the patient worksheets? Was it the comparative outcomes or was it the financial sense? So let me ask you, Robert, which one yeah. do you think would have the biggest impact on performance? I'm thinking, and, and here's my, my thought process. We'll see how good I am at uh, this. But uh, I'm thinking that m the vast majority of physicians want to do a great job for their patients. So it's not and a matter of motivation. Exactly. It's, it's really making it easy that improves performance. So it's that... Uh -huh. It's the first two that come to mind immediately as what makes it uh, performance improve because I'm going to do, if you gave me nothing else, 
but uh, those first two, I would be willing to bet you get a huge increase in performance. You had the third, and yes, I'm competitive. I don't want to be at the bottom of the list. Probably number two would be number one, number one, number two, number three, number three, and number four would come in last. So zero impact from financial incentives, none whatsoever. Wow. This matches a, a fairly extensive published literature, by the way, about what motivates people in what are called heuristic tasks that require thought and adjustment on the fly. And financial incentives actively damage performance that's well established in the, that literature. Yeah. All right. So financial incentives are a really, really bad idea at an individual practitioner level. You might argue that they could work at an organizational level. It turns out the first two are about 90% of the effect. Ah. The comparative outcome is 5 to 10%. What really happened, I used to joke and say, hey, you do poorly on your, your performance and it's worth a free lunch. Your medical director is going to invite you to lunch. <laughs> what actually happened at lunch, though, about 80% of it happened at a staff level, not a physician level. Gotcha. And it was yeah. a conversation, you know, we think we know the process for this. Can we come in and train your staff how to support you this way? You're, you're setting up the systems that allow them to perform optimally. I've asked this to thousands of people. Why is it that, oh, 90% of them say comparative outcomes, including the physicians? Huh. That's fascinating. Well, I, you know, uh, there is that it does get a lot of uh, time and attention and yeah. uh, but you know what? When when I'm when you force me to think about what's yeah. going to make a difference. Well, you were following it through, and the, the answer is obvious. Yeah, make it easy. You know, yeah, because I want to take right. good care of people. There's nothing that makes me want to do poorly for my patients. You know, yeah. zero uh, incentive to do that. So if you make it easy for me, I'm going to perform. So think of those top-down measurement systems that are designed, they are built for selection, comparative outcomes, who's good versus who's bad, then yeah. tie it into accountability and financial incentives, right? They're at the bottom of the list there and, and actively yeah. damaging performance if you, if, if, if you believe the literature. Is that accurate? That's what the evidence shows. Yeah. Once again, if you follow the evidence, guess what? Things work out quite nicely. Following yeah, the evidence yeah. is a really good idea. <laughs> it, it, it is kind of if it's a, if it's solid evidence, you know, then absolutely that's a good idea. But you know what you were saying earlier about statistics can be tricky sometimes, and you know this yeah. this notion that if any two comparators are statistically significant, the whole list gets credit. I mean, uh, it, you can get fooled by statistics. How do we know? that the evidence, uh, we have to talk to Brent James, I guess, to know that the evidence there are is far solid. better statisticians out there than me, but well, you have but, to be thoughtful, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I think it's human nature. We all like to play number one. We all like, it's kind of salacious interest. How do I compare? It turns out it's not a very good change lever. When you have the powers that be, the government and the insurers all pushing that view, I think that's one of the reasons it's so hard to change. So the bottom line, if I'm if I'm correct, First of all, physicians have to believe in the metric. And the best way to do that is to get them to help you design it because it's, it's meaningful. That they actually want and need things that are meaningful that they use every day. That's right. Exactly. And then and then second of all, building it into the workflow so that it's seamless, yeah. or in fact better than seamless. Maybe it makes the workflow easier for them. And if you do those two things. The rest is window dressing and, and actually may be counterproductive. And when I say the rest, I'm talking about comparative data and reward and punishment. Well, you know, I, I honestly believe that an insurer has, a, has an obligation to show that they're getting good value for the money they're spending. I get that part. You know, that's a legitimate view. The, the key is just to focus on where the, the work gets done and where the change happens. That's what okay. you want to do. And then build bottom up from there, coming up gotcha. the stack. From there. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, I started by saying we had the EMR. We could manipulate that EMR this way. Yeah. We had the cost data, but this is the third thing we had. And frankly, you know, as a youngster, I learned it at Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. It was a mandate and a good one. Yeah. And when I came to Inner Mountain, all that I did was take those principles that I now knew intimately and morph them, transform them a bit to fit in this new setting. Well, it was transformational for Intermountain. I remember the first time I even heard the term Intermountain Healthcare 
It must have been the early 90s. I just opened my practice in Greeley, Colorado. My boss said, hey, uh, we want you to go attend this uh, weekend workshop. But what I remember most vividly, because I was a critical care doc, was Alan Morris's story. And, and it taught me a couple of things. Uh, one is that you don't know unless you look. Now, and the second was that usual care is not a control. Yeah. That, uh, you know, the, the value of simply standardizing the way that you care, even if it's a control group, yeah. has value because instead of comparing against chaos, which might be totally different chaotically the next week, you're comparing against a standard. So how does my device compare against the standard? And that was that was a revelation to me too at the time. And and I, you know, docs don't get a lot of statistical training typically. And yeah. we don't get a lot of training in quality improvement, typically. And it is a different mindset. You have to kind of shift thinking from individual patient to groups and to uh, colleagues and how we all work together. To And that's, yeah. that's sort of the nature of population health. Yeah, and learning from each other on a broad yeah. basis. Yeah. Learning from each other. By the way, about 45% of the waste savings with quality associated waste fall at a population health level. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's another fun part of the whole discussion. About 40% of clinical variation within current practice. That includes patient safety. When a patient has an untoward event, we end up treating it. And so it increases resource consumption. Only about 15% administrative. And that includes fraud and abuse. Uh, it includes administrative overhead. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's an interesting, interesting little model to look at. Uh, now, I actually have really high hopes. I think that... Um, this is solid science, and solid science tends to play through over time. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that over time, we're likely to see far, far better decision support for active practicing clinicians at the front line, which is an essential piece. I think that's the real game changer. Uh, it's going to get better and better. Those kids were training, they're going to have it so easy compared to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lucky guys. Hey, yeah. I, let, let me ask you a, a, a quick question about overall. How do you how do you see that playing out? There are lots of pessimists out there today. I, I was uh, listening to somebody speak the other day, and they said, "Oh gosh, there are uh, half a million Japanese millennials who haven't left their bedroom. Fifty percent of that group has not left their bedroom for three years. They're not seeking work. They're not seeking education. They've sort of given up." I'm like you. I'm an optimist. I think eventually we'll get there. Now, you know, it, and, and I think you've mentioned this before when I've talked to you, it's all a matter of how bad it has to get before we turn around. I'll think of it a different way, Robert. Think of when we were both young, youngsters, first yeah. entering the practice of medicine. Compare practice of medicine today to what it was back in the 70s and early 80s when we were coming into practice. Fair enough. It, it, no question at all. It's obvious. It's striking. Yes. Dramatically better. Yes. And, yes, and that's the story of medicine. That's the story of the history of medicine. And it's on a, an increasing curve, you see. And that yeah. curve is continuing to work forward. It's, it's, it hasn't stopped. Right. The care today, when I look at it, is just so much better than when we were interns and residents and young men first in practice. No yeah. question about it. That, that, yeah. that, that hasn't stopped. That's still going on. Yeah. Uh, now, I like the fact that people are a little disgruntled and are a little mm. discouraged. And the reason is it means that they're seeing how it could be better still. Mm -hmm. Because usually the fruits of that dissonance is, is that we figure out how to take that next step to, you know, uh, move a little further into the dark and bring light. We become even more of a true blessing, a true miracle to people who, who seek our help in their hour of need. And I am absolutely on that same page. I am, I'm going to make noise, though, about the things that, uh, you know, and that's a little bit of that being disgruntled, right? I'm going to make noise about the things that I, that I see that, that need attention. And uh, uh, yeah. the cost of care and burnout are two major issues right now that, uh, that we've yep. got to begin to address. So, uh, but I'm with you. I mean, that, you know, I yep. think about the first heart uh, attack patient, the MI patient I took care of. What we did was watch them, you know, and you get morphine. Didn't die. <laughs> uh, yeah, hope they didn't die. That's right. We just watched and put them on bed rest. And, uh, you know, it was just amazing to me 
uh, how much progress we've made in a very short period of time and and survival in the ICU. And that's been, that's been good housekeeping more than anything else that has dramatically improved uh, ICU survival. So yeah, there are lots of things to celebrate, but you know, it, it is, it's tough when it's out of reach for so many people in this country. Now at the margin, if they need rescuing, we're going to rescue them. Yeah. But at, at, at what cost? Is it going to bankrupt them? Uh, you know, are they going to uh, have yeah. uh, medical debt for the rest of their lives? We've got to address that issue as well. And uh, that's a tougher issue to address. But when you look at how much money is available, if we get our processes and our process improvement, get the quality waste out, we've got plenty of money to take care of our population. Well, let's just be clear about that. So 2010, IOM committee, we called together the experts. We were looking explicitly estimates of quality associated waste. It was actually at our press conference where we released the report. What we said is a minimum of 30%, probably over 50% of all spending in healthcare delivery today is waste. Quality associated waste. The way you get the waste out is higher quality care, by the way, which just makes it very attractive. That means you align money to mission. Uh, So the key to good financials is high quality care done properly. Fair enough. Yes. Oh, wait enough. a fifty percent. When I model it, I have a good comprehensive model that I like a lot because I built it and has <laughs> special features. I get about sixty-five percent waste. I will admit, wow. one person's waste is another person's income. Yes, yeah. And so that, that is waste true. tends to defend itself rather vigorously, especially <laughs> in political mechanisms, right? But it's coming yeah. out. Well, let's put that in context. We're spending almost four trillion now. That's like right, four trillion. Something. So- we got, so, a, we got a market upside of $2 trillion with the T dollars here. Name yeah. anything else in the world that comes anywhere even in the same universe as that. $2 trillion in play? There's plenty available if we are wise in designing our systems and correcting our misunderstandings and, and silly notions. Well, and measurement's one of the critical tools that underlies that. Yeah, very clear. Uh, this is not an yeah. accusation against metrics. This is not a... Who was it that uh, said that if it you know if you can't measure it you can't manage it? I can't. I usually was... attribute that to Thomas Monson, but the, many people have said that same thing. The, the problem is, of course, these top-down accountability metrics coming from outside that just destroy everything in their path. Kind of, yeah. Way too many of the wrong metrics. Th- this will sort itself out eventually. It'll, we'll get there on it. The pain in the middle sure is no fun, though, is it? No, it's not. I think that's a, a good place to wrap it up. I, I just have one more question for you. Are you are you making any plans to reinvigorate the teaching that you used to do at Intermountain Health, where you trained thousands of clinicians and administrators in the very topic that we're discussing today? So um, my current favorite is uh, the program we're running at Stanford. Dr. David Larson leads it. It's called ACIS. And okay. that one is as good as the old ATP, the old advanced training program, Robert. Now, on the other hand, Raj Srivastava, Dr. Raj Srivastava, a pediatrician, he now runs the institute at Intermountain. Uh, Intermountain CEO just stepped down, Mark Harrison. Yes. And I'm hoping that that will result in a change of vision and direction for Intermountain. Gotcha. It had an explicit goal to just get big, to grow, uh, and it had some consequences. Um, I think that if Raj is given a uh, free field of fire, that the Intermountain ATP could come back. Well, so I hope so. Moment, yeah. moment, I really like Stanford. I think it's uh, it's 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 right up there where the ATP was. Okay, I, you know, I happen to uh, know the the chief clinical officer, newly ordained because he was acquired in that re- most recent merger. And so I'm going to bend his ear a little bit and uh, and see if uh, he can support that effort because that that was such a valuable program and I know it can be again and I appreciate that uh, that advice I, and that I, I I always say it's a final question but I have one more <laughs> favorite international healthcare system and why my favorite international healthcare system is probably Sweden. 10.2 million people, it's organized at a county level. So 21 health systems at a county level usually build around a big hospital. They have a more comprehensive social system. Only mm. about a third of their spending goes to healthcare. About two thirds of their social spending goes to other mechanisms. And as a result of that, it works well. Now, frankly, Robert, they have the same problems we do. 
unwarranted clinical variation, inappropriate care, patient safety issues, inability to execute, the same exact, but uh, they come as close as anybody. Now, when it comes to rescue medicine, people with really life-threatening diseases, the United States blows the doors off the rest of the world. Yep. Including Sweden, <laughs> just in passing. Yeah. yeah. We're the best in the world when it comes to rescue medicine. Yep. Rescue medicine is not strongly associated with life expectancy. <laughs> yes. And most of the people who have those problems have short life expectancy anyway, so you're not gaining an awful lot uh, yeah. there in the end of life. Uh, and there's a downside. It's highly dangerous, and you might have to treat oh, five or even ten patients to get one miracle. But yeah, yeah. Miracles. So there's some trade-offs. That's one of the things patients really want, though, is that idea of rescue. They really value yes. it highly. So let's not discredit it too much here. I frankly have lived and worked in the U.S. system, and I think we have huge potential. Yeah. I spend a lot of time with a lot of other health systems, as I mentioned, advising the government of Singapore, be down in Australia, up in Canada a lot, across Europe a lot. We all face the same core problems. So I think the power lies in our hands, not in the hallways of power in Washington. This is one that physicians and nurses are going to solve. And we are solving it, and when we do, it will be a much, much better world. Well, I am absolutely on that same page with you, and I'm glad to hear you say that. And once again, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. And gosh, I look forward to the next time. Well, well thank you, Robert. It's a delight as always. Uh, go forth and prosper. Go make something <laughs> better. <laughs> All right, I'll do that. All right, and with that, we're going to say uh, so long. You've been listening to The Groves Connection, your connection to the inside story on healthcare, featuring in-depth interviews with those who know. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, give us a five-star review to keep the connection going, and hit the subscribe button to be sure you never miss a beat. The Groves Connection is produced by Dr. Robert Groves. Original music, editing, and creative direction provided by Alden Groves. Production support, content guidance, courtesy of Janae Sharp and Elizabeth Barrett. Thank you for listening. The professional ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast are mine and do not reflect those of any current or past employers. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you'll join us next time on the Groves Connection.